Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text once again, Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, until recently, there's been very few sports on TV, as most events were postponed or canceled due to the COVID virus. And during that time, when there wasn't anything new to to broadcast, ESPN and many of the other sports broadcasting stations would either have reruns or documentaries or sometimes that even show uh, some of the more lesser known sports. Axe throwing competitions, uh, uh, national cornhole competition, or, or even the great uh, uh, world's strongest competition. And those world's strongest competitions are always fun to watch as as these massive people uh, pull and lift and carry and do what seems abnormal, uh, and yet uh, they are doing it for that one title to prove they are the strongest. Now, one of those uh, uh, events uh, that always amazes me is the Atlas Stone. They've got these big old boulders that are 200, 300, 400, even more pounds. And it's a competition to see who can lift the most onto the platform and do it the quickest in case there is a tie in terms of the number of stones lifted. And it's amazing to watch how they can use such strength to lift something so heavy. And in our gospel text, Jesus too talks about lifting and carrying, but he's not talking about stones. He's talking about the cross. And it's not very heavy of a cross, at least compared to those atlas stones those, those big guys are lifting. But as we look at the context and the implications of this cross, we're going to see it's actually much heavier than the atlas stone itself. Now to understand our story, well, let's get a running start into it from last week. In fact, it builds off of last week and flows immediately from where we were. Remember last week, Pastor Marcus preached about the text where uh, Jesus asked the disciples in, in verse 13, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they respond to all these answers, and then he zeroes in and says, who do you say that I am? And then in verse 16, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus commends Peter for such a confession and says that's what the church is going to be built on, a confession like that. So then, right after that, immediately after that, verse 21, the beginning of today's text. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day, be raised. Now notice, in this first time that Jesus reveals his future suffering, he does not say how he's going to suffer. He just says the Son of Man must suffer. He also doesn't give us a reason for why he needs to suffer. We, of course, in our perspective, know why he is going to suffer, but the disciples have no clue at this point. This prediction, though, by Jesus is a major turning point in Matthew's Gospel. See, when we go back to the very beginning of the Gospel, chapter 4, right after Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, as he begins his ministry, it starts this way. Chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach. The exact same phrase we hear today. And this time, or at least we'll start there, that time it was to start his ministry, he's now going to preach. This time there is a shift in ministry. This time he is saying he's going to Jerusalem for a purpose. And Peter, he's not impressed. In fact, it's amazing how quickly Peter turns. He goes from confessing Jesus is the Son of God, he is the Christ, to now confronting Jesus about this suffering, saying it cannot happen. Which, of course, shows us the danger also of becoming conceited and prideful over the current circumstances you are in. But Peter, he goes from being lifted up by Jesus to now being rebuked by Jesus. All because Peter wanted Jesus to go a different way. Peter thought he had better plans for Jesus that did not include suffering or death or even being raised up on the third day. And that's part of the problem, isn't it? That 
that we have great ideas ourselves, and many times our ideas for life run counter from God's plans for us. Kind of Isaiah 55, verse 8, all over again. My thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. God's ways, they seem off at times. I'm sure many of us would prefer to rewrite a chapter of our past or even rewrite the present, and I know many of us would prefer to rewrite the way this year is going. Peter, he tries to rewrite, and he was rebuked. And maybe that's putting it lightly. Jesus says to him, verse 23, Get behind me, Satan! You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Can you imagine being Peter for a moment? I mean, we get upset if somebody desecrates our name and speaks ill of us. If someone calls us something derogatory, we get angry or start to simmer on the inside even if we don't show it. Especially when things get heated. You look online in any sort of debate and and there's a theory that's been proven over and over that it doesn't take much time before somebody gets called Hitler or a Nazi. And if that's you, or if you get called that, you get frustrated, you get angry, you want to fight back, and Jesus turns to Peter and identifies Satan within Peter. And then, he continues right in, verse 24, finally to our text. Then, Jesus says to the disciples, if anyone would follow me, would come after me, let him take up his cross, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now that's the first time we've heard the word cross in all of the gospel. And so we know the bigger picture of what the cross is, but the disciples, they have no clue right now. They, we know Jesus will die on that cross. They didn't know that. They, we know he's going to forgive sins through that cross. They don't know that. They only know that the cross is an instrument of Roman torture and capital punishment. They know it's reserved for the worst of the worst. But the cross in this context does not show Jesus on it yet. We're not there yet. The cross in this context for the disciples is simply a way of following Jesus, a a way of of being his disciple. And so Jesus turns to Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. And on the cross, with the cross, behind Jesus, that's where the church is found. That's where we are to be. Peter hears this as a rebuke, and rightfully so, and yet Jesus is speaking a great truth in there. Get behind me, because that's where we are to be found. And that's how we follow him. And Jesus gives us these three verbs in our text today to describe what following him looks like. He says, deny yourself and take up your cross. These are both in the past tense. It's a one-time event that occurred, and later we can tie that to baptism if you'd like, because That's ultimately where we are, buried with Christ and raised with him, as Paul says in Romans 6. But Jesus uses the one-time, past-tense verb, deny yourself, take up your cross. Then, he says, follow me, and that's a present-tense, kind of a continual. So you can almost read the verse as, as, at one time, deny yourself, one time, take up your cross, but continue to follow me every day. And as you take up your cross, We continue to experience the challenge that the disciples experienced back then. Because while they didn't understand fully what the cross meant, many times today we still struggle with the oddity of what the cross is. In fact, we've lost some of the offensive nature of it. We we instead gold-plate it and put it on our jewelry, or or we hang a beautiful cross in the front of the sanctuary, and those are all good things. Uh, We put artwork of the cross on our Bible covers or on the walls of our home, and those are good things to remind us of the cross. Don't hear me wrong. Or sometimes we'll use the Uh, The phrase carrying our cross as if it's an identification of a burden that we have. For example, Pastor Marcus will often say in the office to me, uh, you are the cross that I must bear. And there might be some truth to that. It's still taking it out of context, though. To take up our cross, as Jesus says, is to deny ourselves. And that's hard because the world will tell us something different. The world says we need to be ourselves. We need to find ourselves. We need to look within ourselves. And Jesus says to lose yourself, not to the music or the moment like the rapper Eminem says, but to lose yourself in the cross. 
And as we lose ourselves in the cross, now we're starting to face that Satan that is deep within that Jesus identified when he said, get behind me, Satan. See, the first enemy that we must tackle is not the world itself. The first enemy we must tackle is actually ourselves in our own heart. Because the root of sin is found deep within ourselves and it reveals itself in really two primary ways, very related, but two somewhat different ways. The first is that God isn't always right. That we try to manipulate or adjust God's plans, assuming that we know what is best. That's Peter's temptation. Far be it from you, Lord, that you should suffer. And the second way, the evil, the enemy, the, the sin reveals itself is in a very similar way. Instead of trying to control God, it's now trying to control others. Because I'm in charge and I know what's best. And you need to conform to my plan. And so I will use criticism and competition and comparison in order to reveal that my heart knows what is best. But Jesus shows us a different way of life. Deny yourself and your desires. Lose yourself in the cross and find something different. And as you do, you find Jesus' way. So twice we've said Jesus, or excuse me, twice we've said Matthew uses that phrase. From that time Jesus began to, first to preach, then to reveal his suffering. We find that phrase a third time in the gospel. Chapter 26, from that, time, from that moment, from that time, Judas sought an opportunity to betray Jesus. Now here's our third turn of the gospel. The phrase is almost identical, isn't it? Jesus preached, then he showed must, what must happen. Now it's going to happen through Judas as Jesus is revealing his true identity through the cross, as he denies himself and takes up his cross, and through that cross he reveals a new life that he freely gives to you. Jesus, throughout today's text, he's speaking in pure black and white, isn't he? He's showing us this is radically new and different. There is death versus resurrection. There is God versus Satan. There is the things of God versus the things of man. There is saving your life versus losing your life. There's no gray area when it comes to following Jesus. Likewise, there's no gray area when it comes to what he has done for you because Jesus loses his life to bring life to those who have lost their life to sin. And as he denies himself, he invites you to deny yourself, to repent, to return, and to come from that sin and experience life in Jesus. So Jesus, he goes to the cross, and as he is going to that cross, we read it later in Matthew 27, as they went out on the way to the cross, they found a man, Simon of Cyrene, and they compelled him to carry his cross. So Simon Peter, earlier on, we said he rebuked Jesus for his suffering. Now we find another Simon, and this Simon carries the cross. Simon of Cyrene is the first of the any ones where Jesus says, if anyone would, follow, would come after me, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. The Simons are different, for sure, and their expression of faith is different as well. Simon Peter, he swings on that pendulum of faith where he's later restored after denying Jesus three times, and remember right before his death? After he denies Jesus, he's later restored, and so much so he goes and proclaims the resurrection of Jesus. Sometimes we're on that pendulum where we are weak, and we go our own way, and we kick and scream against God's plan, but Jesus' words are still true and his actions still carry weight as he comes to forgive. Other times, we are like Simon of Cyrene where we are right behind Jesus and helping carry that cross or we're right behind Jesus carrying our own cross as we are following him as he leads the way forward in faith. And while the world's strongest may never be able to carry or measure the weight of this cross, it's because it's heavy in its own way, a different way. And while the strongest of strong people can lift those atlas stones, we need help with our cross. And that's where Jesus comes. When he says in Matthew chapter 11 that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We all have different crosses to bear. That is true. As we look in our hearts and see the temptations of sin that are deep within. But the result is always the same. The invitation of Jesus is always the same, to return, to repent, to deny yourself, to take up your cross and to follow him. And as you follow him, you will see he is right there leading the way. In fact, he's carrying your cross for you. Amen.
And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds together with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.